very, very, very cool. Um, I appreciate your, uh, uh, I was a soft spot for, for those linkages going from observations at a um, genomic uh, or even transcriptomic level to function. So it was really great. Um, I also have to confess that my, my kids dropped a handful of fried bacon on my keyboard as I was introducing you. So, <laughs> so work from home. What can I say? That's amazing. So uh, uh, forgive me if I fumbled uh, your introduction at all. But um, no the good news is we are now at our question and answer session. And for you all as our viewers, this is your chance to ask our amazing speakers, uh, all five of them. Uh, anything and everything. So please don't be shy. Uh, we have quite a nice chunk of time here. And the idea is just to, to, to uh, give you all a chance to, to kind of have a dialogue. Um, as I've said before, there's really no such thing as, as too simple or complex or dumb a question, right? We all come from different perspectives uh, and we're at your disposal. So please send them on in uh, and uh, we'll hang out uh, and field your questions. So please uh, type them in the uh, in the Q&A box there. Uh, you as can a reminder, also, if yeah, somebody's brave enough to want to ask a question out loud, or if it's particularly difficult to type, uh, you can raise your hand and we'll see that. And then I can invite you to ask it aloud also. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, um, uh, that's, that's, it's your choice, right? And uh, you don't even have to be brave, just raise your hand. I mean, we're all harmless. Um, so here's what we have so far in our Q&A, and I'll give the rest of you a chance to, um, uh, to, uh, to chime in. So uh, Treveni, you uh, started by asking a question, but it looks like a phrase, and maybe it got cut off. Um, if you're still on Treveni, you were asking a question presumably to uh, Oded about Rhodops in the biofilms. So if you want to chime in and elaborate a bit, that would be great. Uh, so we'll wait, we'll wait on that. Uh, Alex Hall asks, do you see any evidence for phages evolving their codon usage over time to become more aligned with the host? Or does the difference in codon usage confer an advantage to the phage? That means that they maintain such a different, that they maintain a different repertoire of tRNAs. That's a cool question. And uh, Alex says, thanks for a great talk, Dr. DeHave. Sure, I can start to tackle that, though I'm not the um, expert in that, meaning that uh, not from our data have we observed that, but there's been there's evidence for fish host um, kind of co-evolution that um, is observed in uh, like, like amelioration of fish and host genome, which is presumably driven by codon usage. Um, but yeah, uh, so. On the one hand, the fitness of a virus and its host are kind of inextricably linked as well as that of um, it, their evolutionary trajectories, but they're not uh, obligately interacting with one another and exclusively interacting with one another. So you have mixed into this, the need to think about um, host range and uh, kind of the balance between in a given system, uh, viruses with wide, broad host ranges and the trade-offs that that might uh, confer and how they may manifest at the genome level of both, as well as the, the virus host pairs or viruses that are very host specific and how that might manifest at the genome level. So there's a spectrum, or there are multiple axes along which um, things are operating that uh, can, you know, I think for, for those viruses and hosts that are specifically uh, aligned, you will see uh, amelioration and, and codon, yes, evolving similar codon usage patterns, but it's complicated. <laughs> it's very cool, thanks, often is complicated. Um, I, um, let's see, uh, Dr. Gavin, do we have any hands up? Yes, actually from Amanda, so I'll just allow you to talk here and feel free to voice your question. Hi, um, this is Amanda Fotenhauer. I'm from the University of Michigan. And my question is for Melissa. So you were talking about how these Vero cells differ maybe in the metabolites that they're able to make or produce. Um, I was wondering if you can also look at just individual interactions. So if you're able to kind of 
grow these cells and look at um, like cross feeding with one other species that you know they normally interact with or compete with and just kind of get like on a micro scale like a single interaction and see how that changes it. Yeah, and you're thinking about this in the context of your cell? Yes. Yeah, so that's really interesting. I was teasing about a part kind of the details of this as I was putting this talk together because sometimes I realized we were referring to the VR cell ecosystem footprint and other times we, I, I was querying whether we need to be more precise by saying environmental footprint. And I think that what you're asking uh, hits upon that distinction and how I think we'll try to use it in the future. So when I think of ecosystem, I think of all the interacting parts, which includes the environment and the other organisms. And so then I start, so what we've observed so far, I think is more environmental footprint, like those abiotic components of the environment. How are they being affected by um, the infection uh, as it proceeds? And so then I thought, well, cool, the next experiments should be looking at the like ecosystem. And it, you know, they were pretty much as you just proposed, what if we make a mock community and infect just our, um, you know, put in our, our model uh, face host pair and, and look at the, the impacts that um, they may be having on other community members. I think there are a number of ways you could ask that also probably in situ, but uh, so I, not necessarily an answer, but pointing out the distinction between ecosystem and environment, I think is important to um, then incorporate that idea. Well, thanks. Thanks, Amanda. That was great. Yeah. Now, now um, I have a couple other questions for Melissa, but let me, um, let me start with a question from um, Heather Olins that I'd like to pose to all of our speakers this morning. Heather asks, what are your favorite environmental micro or microbial ecology investigations to carry out with novice undergraduates? Mm -hmm. So let's go from ARPADA to a dead to a Melissa to Melissa, if that's okay. What are your favorite environmental micro or microecology investigations? Photoshops. <laughs> Always phototropes. They are so beautiful. There's so many shades and they're so easy to isolate. You don't have to go very far. You can go in your backyard. So definitely phototropes. <laughs> I, I would say bioluminescence. Oh. This is also so easy to isolate them. And then, uh, you know, you can ask so many questions. Bone sensing. And, and, and others, why do they need it? So bioluminescence, I would think. Yeah, well, those, well, those are great. So we got phototrophs, bioluminescence. Melissa, what's your take? Well, I was thinking back to like the most memorable aha moments in some of my lab classes. Uh, one was learning how to use a reference manager <laughs> and that you can automatically generate a citation list. Uh, not necessarily explicitly microbiology, but that is something that wows them every time. And I think uh, also in silico, um, there's so much 16S Implicon data available freely and empowering the undergrads with the skills to manage that. So getting them into R and working with those data that has been another place where I've seen um, really like immense potential for growth because, well, clearly we think about the data in ecological terms. You can bring in many different concepts of ecology in the context of microbes and then think about why these patterns may, may be emerging. That is a good point to remind us all that there are these massive publicly available databases uh, that are accessible. Um, and I could imagine, Heather, you know, that the three ideas shared here, um, you know, could could each could each be a part of of um, uh, undergraduate experience, right? Because they they could each sort of tell you something different about microbiology uh, and uh, sort of address different questions. Those are great responses. Thanks, friends. Um, Melissa, we have a question from uh, Krista Longnecker about whether you have hypotheses about which metabolites will show the greatest difference across the two vera cells. Uh, 
I have to admit, when I saw this pop up, I had to uh, quickly write to Morgan, the grad student, like, what do you think? <laughs> so <laughs> I know she's watching this. Um, and I can say uh, her response <laughs> is that, um, let me read it first. Yeah. Um, so another concept that we're trying to layer into this thinking is uh, the notion of a bottleneck. And actually that becomes much more important when you bring in the idea of the environment and thinking about where is the bottleneck. In the data I showed today, we saw that it was at the level of intracellular resources. That was where the, you know, things were hitting the limit and that's where you start to see differences manifest because the phage were able to get to the point of transcription translation. But in the case of, uh, of extremely limiting environment, they may not even be, get, get to be able to get there. And so then the, the bottleneck would be more at the energetic level um, from resource limitation. Um, and so bottlenecks are important. And so I can see that's probably inspiring Morgan's response, which is uh, the metabolites that relieve the virus cells of the greatest bottlenecks. So the biomolecules in the lysates such as um, amino acids could be a metabolite that would have greatest difference between the two. In the first experiment, though, I'll say we don't have the axon metabolome for that. We only have it for the <laughs> environment. Hmm. Well, that's very yeah, cool. I, I have a question, if I can butt in with one. Uh, Arpita, I'm really curious how your lab member managed to delete the essential rubisco genes. <laughs> so that's the cool thing about some of these phototropes that they can grow aerobically like we do. And so that's how he got the mutants. So he grew them aerobically and uh, then he, the cells didn't require uh, the Calvin cycle for autotrophy anymore. And then he would make the mutants grow them aerobically and then wash them and test them under the essential conditions of autotrophy. But even then it took a very long time. It was almost like Rubisco had some function on the aerobic growth because it was like, it took two years to get mutants in aerobic conditions. So, wow, yeah. Do you feel paranoid about those mutants? Have you had to, have you sequenced them to make sure that everything else is okay? Yeah, and they used to get very easily contaminated with wild types, so we had to keep mm. the Thing, you know, we had a lot of tests to make sure it was always clean and sure. Really, so yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah. So, Arpita, that's interesting. So, if I heard you just to make sure that I'm understanding this and that our audience participants are, are hearing this correctly, so um, autotrophy uh, is used primarily under anaerobic conditions. Is that right? In and these you organisms. Them, yeah. You grow them aerobically and heterotrophically. Yes. Right. And that's interesting because so often there is this um, idea that, um, you know, heterotrophic growth, uh, you know, could be so much more energetically favorable. <laughs> and yet, you know, here you are seeing the absence of, you know, key parts of, of the CBB cycle having an impact. Just wild speculation. Any guess on what might be going on there? Yeah. So I mean, we were, uh, we, you know, when we were making the mutants with heterotrophic growth and rich medium, like you know, yeast extract and peptone, and we were having so much trouble for the CBB cycle. Um, you know, we started thinking that maybe when we were growing them heterotrophically under some conditions, they go anoxic. And when they go anoxic, they might require carbon dioxide and some for some growth parameters. And for that to assimilate that, they still require rubisco. I don't know. It's I haven't explored, uh, you know, what is going on, but it's possible that you know eventually, as we grow them, oxygen becomes limiting, and then they're not doing just heterotrophy alone anymore. Right. It's almost like mixotrophy. Right. And Indeed. Then, yeah. yeah, it's becoming relevant. But yeah, we learned a lot through uh, the deletion of essential genes in that way. Right, and and of course there there's all the states in between aerobic 
a sort of oxic and anoxic, right? There's everything that sits between those two and what's happening under sort of hypoxic conditions and where the tipping point really is, is, is also intriguing. That's, that's a really cool point. Um, yeah, yeah, especially in the environment. Yeah, right, absolutely. Uh, Cool, thank you. So we have a couple of other questions here. So Hyman Hartman poses a question. Cyanobacteria carry out one quarter of the photosynthesis on the planet. What is the effect of viruses on their, on this geochemical carbon cycle? Anybody wanna take a shot at that? I, I can start. Uh, we showed the, uh, what was that, 2009, that uh, some cyanophages do carry photosynthetic genes mm. from photosystem one, from photosystem two. And later on, we did show that uh, they actually let the cy infected cyanobacteria carry on photosynthesis. Otherwise, at least photosystem two is falling apart um, during infection. So actually, I would say that infected cells at least those that I know, uh, cyanobacteria, would keep on doing photosynthesis during infection. Uh, and actually, uh, viruses that carry uh, photosystem one and photosystem two genes are actually also, like the virus said, they are changing uh, linear uh, photosynthesis into cyclic photosynthesis. So all they care is to make more ATP uh, they don't care about CO2 fixation, so they change also the photosynthesis of the infected cells. But photosynthesis is going on, at least in the ocean, in the photic zone. This is what I know. Um, yeah, that's very cool. The um, Let's see, we have uh, another question that came in. Um, Dr. Duhaime, would you mind uh, answering this one uh, or sort of sharing this out loud? The question was from Karen Farner about um, your interest in fitness seems based on replication of viral particles. Have you thought about fitness in terms of the ability to lysogenize? Yeah, so for those of you, uh, I think, can folks see the answer that I just wrote? In the broad crowd. So I can, I, I answered this in the text, including um, a reference there. So yes, I did forget to explicitly say that this talk was very much uh, a synthesis and thinking about the lytic phage infection process, uh, which is, you know, we don't know really relatively, but it's only one of a number of different strategies for infection. And um, I expect many of the things that I talked about today to differ in scenarios with other infection classes. And an important one is exactly because we do try to frame it in fitness, the definition of fitness is very important, but you don't want a definition that is different for each uh, viral class. And so a lot of um, uh, good work and thinking has gone into this uh, redefining and defining uh, viral fitness. Uh, and I put a, a link to a recent review uh, on the topic of kind of the rules of life and how viruses intersect with that. And there they lay out uh, an explicit definition of viral fitness that is universal across all infection classes. So hopefully that can help to kind of found that it's really important. So, it, so I guess the important thing to recognize is it's not it's definitely not uh, viral particles, I will say. And, and I tried to make that explicit uh, with a small reference that it wasn't the count of viruses uh, that we used as a fitness measure. It was the number of viruses that, was, that were able to carry out infection. So able to move on to the next uh, uh, possible host, but on, in, on, in very lab forced manner. Um, so it, we eliminated one of the components of fitness, which is, that extracellular foraging for a host. And so mm -hmm. the fitness we measured is lab fitness, but still it's uh, it's infective viral particles, not just viral particles. So there are some important nuances there, but fitness, def defining fitness is, is very important. Excellent, thank you. Um, so folks, we have um, uh, our question and answer uh, 
queue there at the bottom of your uh, webinar window. So you can hit on the Q&A button, pose your question. If you'd like me to keep it anonymous, I'm happy to do so. Um, so send those questions in. Uh, one thing I would like to ask each of you, though, and what we can start, uh, last time we started with Arpita, let's, uh, let's this time start with Oded and then go Oded, Arpita, and Melissa, uh, is to offer a bit of a crystal ball perspective on your area of work. So where do you see your efforts as well as your colleagues uh, headed in the next five years or so? Uh, and so Oded, you want to kick us off with that? Yep. So we are looking for new vodopsies. Uh, and then we uh, actually are slowing moving from bacteria and archaea into pico eukarya. Uh, because uh, we do find that uh, beside uh, the regular proton pump rhodopsins, they have very exciting new rhodopsins. So enzyme rhodopsins, for example, were found in uh, microbes that are actually eukarya. Uh, and then the varieties are, are enormous. Uh, so we're switching slowly. It's harder to do metagenomics on pico eukarya because the genomes are bigger. You have introns, exons. So it's not easy, but, but we are there. Um, so this is one switch. And I, I didn't mention the, the optogenetics uh, field, which is actually now uh, very popular and they're looking for new rhodopsins all the time. So we are also moving to uh, rhodopsins that would uh, absorb in red and infrared and a couple of those new rhodopsins uh, because if you would have red and infrared uh, absorbing rhodopsins, then all experiments with optogenetics would be easier because you don't need, you know, to stick the electrodes with the right. with the light on those poor animals, if I may <laughs> say. Uh, so I, I would say those are the directions. Very cool, uh, Arpita. Oh, sorry. No, we said, yeah, let's do Arpita then Melissa. Sorry, let's do that. <laughs> Confused myself. So I am very excited about extracellular electron uptake. As I was mentioning at the end of the talk, I was surprised how far we have come in just six years and how the community finds these organisms everywhere. But being trained in, as a geneticist, a physiologist, I think that understanding why this is so common and what the underlying mechanisms are is what our lab is focusing on and uh, you know we are trying to expand how uh, you know we go out for, uh, you know what kinds of environments are we thinking about so we are looking at wetlands but that's not the only environment we can look at so we are looking at the human body and we are also thinking about how this process might be important for the generation of the first eukaryotes so we can co-culture archaea with these organisms that we isolate from Ellis Island and Woods Hole and they grow beautifully as co-cultures. So, um, and they seem to be exchanging electrons. So, you know, that would be interesting in the next five years to see as well. Very cool, thank you. And, uh, <laughs> Melissa, what do you think? Yeah, so I think I made a pitch for this at um, the very few last few seconds of, of the talk that I think and, and this is, you know, future vision is coming from coming from uh, what we struggled with most in interpreting our data. And that was the relative nature of most of the data we collected. So there's been um, great work in, uh, and actually, frankly, some of it not new. So I would say um, some of the first kind of work with quantitative metatranscriptomics spike ins was back in 2013 and 14 by Mary and Moran's group. Um, but it feels like that's, that notion is coming back now in full force. And I think that's what's going to be necessary to kind of take our observations of pathway changes and think of them more in terms of fluxes. And also combining it then with things like uh, stable isotopes. And I can give one pitch for that, that I thought of um, in response to the photosynthesis question. This was work from um, Jake Walbar and Maureen Coleman that 
through the use of, kind of quantitative proteomics and stable isotopes, we're able to show that uh, in the case of a cyanophage, so infecting a cyanobacterium, the viruses acquired uh, over 40, 40, 41 percent of their nitrogen from extracellular sources. And so that's when you start to think about what are the ecosystem level impacts, and you can put numbers on that, not just hypotheticals. And so that's the case of one virus and one host. We know that that interaction uh, can result in uh, different phenotypes of so different impacts. So now we need to expand that to uh, different uh, virus host pairs, and then uh, hopefully uh, make observations about the universality of some of the things we're seeing and uh, being able to link the universal properties of traits of infection with data we can collect in high throughput in the field, like possibly virus and host genomes sequences. So getting more quantitative, linking it together and doing it high throughput, making inferences in high throughput. Oh, uh, that's, uh, that is amazing, right? I mean, in terms of actually what all three of you shared in terms of moving forward and, and being more quantitative, right? And establishing these relationships that uh, that crosscut the systems we study, you know, from, from a genome to a transcriptome and a proteome to metabolites and so on, um, is where I hope we are all headed uh, in microbiology. Um, we have, uh, let's see, a, a question here, which I will share with you, then I'll turn it over to, to Hannah, who I know has a question she'd like to ask. Um, someone asked, um, they recently realized that they hadn't thought much about the bioenergetic differences between bacteria and viruses uh, since high school biology. Are viruses, in fact, defined as alive these days? Like today, do we define viruses as alive? And how do you define life in terms of bioenergetics? And where do viruses fit into this definition? I'm not going to answer this, but I also just feel the need to thank this person, this anonymous person for this question, because I don't think it's silly at all. I can tell you that Michael Gilmore and I are working together on to teach a graduate level class, a graduate level seminar microbiology class. And we recently spent the better part of a two hour class talking about this question, how we conceive of viruses. So I just feel the need to say that and say thanks for an excellent question. It's not silly at all. <laughs> Who wants to take that? What are your thoughts on viruses? I really wanted to punt it to Arpita. I know I talked about viruses, but uh, she did begin her talk with a slide of like, what is life? And I'm really curious, as you were presenting that, I was wondering what your answer to this question might be. I hopefully you don't mind. I think it's philosophical, right? I feel like it gets into this gray area of what we think is alive versus what isn't. I think that I didn't think about this when I was defining life in my view, but viruses are alive. That's my, my vote. Go viruses. <laughs> they're totally alive. I think they're just um, sort of this gray zone of... Uh, they have to be in a host to be able to replicate, but viral particles are alive because they can infect, right? I mean, what do you think? What do you think about it, Melissa? Like I, I, I always get into this philosophical thing with uh, freshmen, they, like Hannah was bringing up. They, they always ask very thoughtful questions like that. and. To me, it seems like it'd be unfair to not account for all these viruses and say that they're dead. So I go for alive. As far as bioenergetically goes, uh, they have to be probably inside a host, but many animal viruses have membranes. Um, what if uh, animal viral, oh, sorry, viral membranes had bioenergetic capabilities? I mean, why wouldn't that be possible? Like I, I, I know that they have uh, only receptors that allow them to attach to uh, host cells. People don't think about them as energy, but then what if there were viruses that had rhodopsins in their membranes? I don't know. Couldn't they make energy? Just a thought. 
I, I don't discuss. want to go. I don't want to go too deep into it, but we are now working on something like this. So, rhodopsins in the membranes, viruses, but not for energy. It's more, you know, to to infect the host. But I, I would say uh, we can easily uh, escape from those questions because uh, we had the term viral cells, and this I think why. Uh, this was coined viral cells because inside the viral cells, those are alive. So, I mean, <laughs> hey, <laughs> so I would say uh, alive, but with the concept of viral cell. Yeah, I think I can expand on this. Uh these nuanced responses. Um, so thinking about them, yes, they can infect, uh, but that infection process, like mechanistically, it relies on, I guess, the potential energy stored in proteins that is then released in certain protein-protein interactions. Without that, they, I mean, without that kind of release of energy, they will stay as these stored inert particles. That's one thing that complicates my idea of them being alive because they can infect. The other is this notion of self-replication. So they need, they can't, so they may be able to store energy, but they can't use it for self-replication. They, they rely on their host. But again, then the actions in the viral cell. So then if we start thinking, okay, viral cells alive, and thinking about, okay, yes, uh, the bioenergetics fits with that concept of alive, but what about self-replication? What is self-replicating at that point? If you check out the different, like the multitude of viral strategies in, in the review that I uh, shared there by Adrian Correa and Paul, uh, you'll see that some viral strategies obligately end in the viral cell or cell death, but it's the virus that goes on. So I guess that would still fit. It's using energy and it's self-replicating. Um, yeah, totally thinking out loud and on the spot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think I heard, I heard at one point the, uh, the concept of a viral particle compared to a seed in the sense that it has the potential to become an, a replicating entity, um, but that the seed itself doesn't replicate other seeds. And so I think that's kind of an interesting, I, I think about that conceptually yeah. a lot too. <laughs> I realized I actually had that analogy in my uh, notes, my slide notes, mm. it. so I'm very glad that you said that. That's uh, I think a useful one in this context. Thanks, folks. Uh, we have a one one question here, and then I do want to turn it over to Hannah because I know she has a question in mind. Um, Amanda Faltenhauer asks uh, for Arpita: Could the electron transport work your lab is doing contribute to bio battery development? Sorry if my daughter interrupts with her answer to this question. <laughs> Yeah, we are. Well, I didn't show any of the sustainable uh, bioproduction work that we are doing. Uh, and Ooh, we are yeah. developing different ways of uh, ca capturing. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> but we are definitely yeah. working on things like that. Sorry. <laughs> of lots of energy. <laughs> <laughs> I was just really appreciating what's going on in your shirt. I feel like that's a very sciencey shirt. That's amazing. Dinosaurs. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Well, I can come in with a question here that I think also relates to things that we, themes we've been thinking about in this this class with Mike. Um, but I think that one of the challenges facing maybe any microbiologist today is balancing the desire and need for mechanistic experiments, which uh, relating maybe gene to gene function to phenotype um, and the inherent reductionist nature of those with the incredible power of sequencing for genomics and metagenomics and breadth of data and the acknowledgement that 
microbes live in complex environments and communities of other organisms. So uh, I realize that that's a broad question, but whatever comes to mind for each of you in terms of how you and your own work balance those sometimes competing desires to think about to think about microbes in their very complex communities, but also to understand specifics about their molecules or about their genes and gene functions. Okay, I, I can start, but uh, yeah, it's a big uh, question. I mean, usually when you do the bioinformatics, then you, you need to decide whether to focus on, on you know, individual or to focus on the entire community. It's an open question. I mean, I don't have an answer. Uh, I think it also depends on your resources. I mean, how many, how many bi good bioinformaticians you have? Um, I would say this is the bottleneck nowadays because we have many, many data sets waiting for us just to, to look at. And it depends on how, how you look at. I mean, it's easier to work on individuals. It's much more complex to, to work on, on the interaction of those with others and you know, the environment. So, I mean, we do both, but it's always a question on, on where to start. I can go next if no one else is. I had to go give my daughter an ice pop, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I think that, you know, I struggle with exactly that. And I think that was demonstrated in my talk as well, starting with a background and just uh, isolated organisms, still isolating them, but always trying to think about how they operate in the environment. And I think, um, I think that the way that I have been managing that is always knowing that what I'm doing is artificial uh, in the lab, appreciating that, uh, always thinking like a microbe. Abigail Saliers was on my committee when I was in grad school in Urbana-Champaign. And she was always telling me to think like a microbe, put your microbial hat on. And I think that that's been a huge help just thinking about that always. And, also, you know, all these omics approaches that Melissa is bringing up um, and how integrating them with that same microbial hat on has been also helping me. I'm, I'm learning how to, uh, you know, know that there are limitations of both these approaches, a completely systems approach and a completely isolated approach and marrying them would require crosstalk and lots of open conversations about the limitations of both. So I think that that's how I've been growing my own mind. Mm -hmm. okay. That makes yeah. a lot of sense, thanks. Can expand on the notions of both of those and that um, yeah, I think we need them all mm -hmm. to understand our systems. I think that's the reason why they are all parts of this field is because there's a need for them um, and like Odad mentioned, in addition to like skills and, and by informaticians, it's like time. It's our lives, like the time of our lives. How do we choose to spend that? And I always bring that back to um, what brings you the most joy. And that's different for different people. So it's probably not a, this is better than this uh, realm to focus your energy in and your life, life vital life source in and your brain power, but follow the things that are fun for you because there are so many other um, folks out there working on all those other parts. So find who they are. If you're not gonna do that yourself, figure out how to work together and then continue to do the parts of the puzzle that uh, bring you the most joy and that you can fund, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. well, you know, I, I would, you know, I wanna thank all of you for those answers and picking up if you don't mind um, sharing a perspective as well on picking up on where Melissa uh, just took us is, you know, I, I often hear students ask, 
you know, what, you know, how, how do I, you know, what do I do to increase my chances for success? Do I pick this university over that university? You know, even graduate students who are applying to work with me saying, oh, well, if I work with you, I, you know, I get to work at this, at this institution and with your lab, but really, you know, my, my passion is in this other thing that's a bit outside of your lab, but it's, you know, a smaller liberal arts college or something. And, you know, to, echo what Melissa said, I think it's important to recognize that if you do what you're passionate about, right, uh, and that is where you're going to shine. I, and in many ways, I think our students often assume that um, studying processes at one scale, uh, uh, for example, they may think that, you know, an omic approach is, is inherently more valuable than an ecosystems approach, or they may say, working with a lab, uh, a, a cultivated microbe is so much better than working with an uncultivated bug because you can do so much more. But the three of you have emphasized that we have to look at uh, our world through these different, from these different vantage points, right? And so pick the one that you are going to be most passionate about because that's where you can make your greatest contributions. I really feel like each of your works too emphasize the way that these can complement each other and and inform each other and so that that feels really like a valuable takeaway for me from each of your talks. Right and if I didn't know better I, I almost feel like the three of you conspired in presenting such a lovely spectrum of amazing work at that cross cut scales and and uh, uh, even different kind of um, habitats, right, from the photosynthetic world to the chemosynthetic world, you know, from uh, cyanobacteria and picoeukaryotes to viruses. It's, I mean, what a, what a heck of a, a way to open our symposium. So thank you all. And of course, our scientist artists who are amazing scientists in their own right, and then do this extraordinary thing that, that, uh, that I find so soul nourishing. Um, do you, uh, I, any of you three have anything you'd like to share uh, before uh, we move into our next part of our symposium. Any closing remarks? Let's start with Melissa this time and then work backwards. Melissa Oded, then Arpada. I was already sitting back and like just reflecting and appreciating, thinking I was <laughs> done with providing. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> so, um, closing remarks. Um, uh, nothing, uh, I guess, super profound, but I'm really excited to see the rest of the art work. And I really appreciate just the, the format of how you've integrated um, all these different passions and shining of various uh, talents. So, art is profound. So, People so, are awesome. <laughs> thank you, Melissa. What about you, Odette? Any parting thoughts? My, mine is very simple. I love doing science. Mm. I mean, I'm enjoying, you know, almost, almost every minute. And it, it's fun, it's fun. It's, it's a hard work because you, usually you don't get, you know, experiments do not work, but every now and then that it works, it's wow. So I, I really love it. Well said, Oded. Uh, Arpada. My highlight was seeing your home office feed. Oh my. <laughs> That's behind your, yeah, uh, is that a Millennium Falcon or? Uh, there is, uh, that's true. There's a Millennium Falcon here. <laughs> this, this is the Apollo, uh, this is the Saturn V rocket that was used for the Apollo moon missions. Behind my head down here is the Wright Brothers flyer. Uh, and then th of course there's a, a, an Enterprise from Star Trek and that is the Bell X-1. It was the first plane to break the sound barrier. So. It's my little shrine to the amazing ingenuities in aerospace that shows what we can do when we put our differences aside and try and do something extraordinary, so. I, I have uh, something to, to tell about Peter. Uh -oh. 20 years ago, he, he used to take my kids and fly rockets. Uh, oh, that's so. right. Remember? I do now. <laughs> How are the rockets powered? Uh, I, motors? I, I would let Peter answer. No, they're just the little model rockets that you buy the rocket motors for. And we, we uh, Odette and I lived uh, in Marina, California uh, in 
an area where there were these open fields. And, and I, I really enjoyed taking your kids out and showing them the model rocketry. So we, we apparently need to do this again, I think. I mean, come on. So, well, this was a wonderful morning, everyone. Thank you. And I uh, am going to uh, uh, now introduce uh, our uh, friend and colleague who is going to be running our lunchtime science trivia. Now, before I introduce Dr. Sarah McCannelty, for the next about hour, we're gonna be uh, doing trivia. And I would really encourage you to hang out with us, go get your lunch, bring your kids, involve, you know, drag your neighbors into it. This is fun and lighthearted. And it's a great way to just sit around and kick back on, uh, on a Saturday. Now, Dr. Sarah McAnulty is actually a squid biologist uh, who earned her PhD in 2019, working with Dr. Spencer Nyholm at the University of Connecticut. She's a prolific science communicator with an active presence on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Sarah founded Skype a Scientist. It's a nonprofit organization focused on connecting scientists around the world with everyone else via personal connections. Since 2017, her programs have connected over 37,000 groups, groups, not people, but groups with scientists, and all of their kid-facing programming is offered for free. You heard that right. Dr. McAnulty's Skype a Scientist programs for kids are free of charge. Now, Skype a Scientist also runs weekly trivia events for adults every Thursday, and on occasion, Sarah and her colleagues uh, do some other uh, activities, like uh, uh, do some um, uh, a more adult sort of oriented evening sessions where we talk science. And uh, I, in fact, I had the privilege of talking to Sarah uh, and her colleagues at an event uh, from a ship one time while I was out at sea. Um, I have to tease Sarah a little bit because I lent her a giant isopod in a glass jar and made her promise to just take good care of it. And then minutes before the event, Sarah said, oh, well, you know, it got dropped on the sidewalk and the glass jar broke and there's ethanol everywhere, but the isopod is fine. 